MJ Hagar is seeing a late surge when it comes to fundraising, at least. Her campaign reported bringing in $13.5 million last quarter. That's enough money to make this an even race, financially at least, with John Cornyn. But just one of the things that we discussed with her here. MJ, thanks for the time. How's it going? Um, good, Jason. How are you? Doing well here. Congratulations on the big fundraising numbers. 13.5 million in the last quarter. The clock is ticking, though, to Election Day, about a month away. How do you put that money to work to get the most bang for your buck in these final weeks? You know, it's really exciting to be in a position where when people learn more about me and John Cornyn equally, then we overtake him in the poll, in the polling. And um, that's exciting because, um, you know, we have every opportunity to win this election. Um, Texans are really fed up with him. He's got a very low approval rating. He hasn't been serving us. He's been legislating like a safe senator. And so looking out for his own special interests and, and I mean, his own self-interest and, and the wealthy special interests and his party leadership and um, the more Texans learn about his record and how his votes and his actions don't match his words and the things that he promises us, um, they're starting to see that we need to replace him. But, but I presume with, with a bank account like that, you're probably spending money on ads, direct mail, things like that. Should, should Texans get ready for a barrage of this stuff? I mean, I think we're used to that in election season, but it's nice to be hearing from two sides instead of one like we normally do in Texas. I, I want to ask you about money is one thing, but, but you're still eight points down in the most recent polls that I've seen from Quinnipiac a few days ago. How do you close that gap with so little time remaining? We don't make any decisions based on polls. That's that's John Cornyn's uh, purview, um, you know, because the polling, I've, I mean, I've seen polls with us one point now, and I've seen um, I just, the, the, the polling only calls on people who have a reliable history of voting. And we've been one of the worst voting turnout states in the, in the union. And now with, that we're setting turnout records, um, a lot of people who are showing up to vote are not reflected in the polling. Uh, we were polling 15 or 20 points down last cycle in the congressional that I ran in the district that was very gerrymandered to be much better than the rest of the state. And we lost by, I think, 2.9 against the guy who won his last midterm by 32 points. And so you just, you can't, you can't, I know that people are anxious and they want to know how these elections are going to turn out because they really impact people. Um, but you have to resist the temptation to, to be able to predict things just based on looking at polling. There is a lot of anxiety. Let me ask you about debates. You have asked for three debates against John Cornyn. Only one has been scheduled. How realistic is it, do you think, that the other two would happen? Oh, I don't think that's going to happen because he has shown time and again that he's afraid to be, to go up side by side with me. Um, the recent Austin American Statesman Ed Board is a really good example of this. That um, traditionally they they interview two candidates together and then both candidates agree to their video being published. And John Cornyn insisted that his video not be published and insisted that he would not be. Um, side by side with me. So that should tell you how he feels about um, how dangerous it is to his election, um, you know, his reelection chances. The more opportunities that Texans have to see us side by side and be able to compare our two visions for this state, although I will say um, it, it may sound a lot alike because he says a lot of the things that I'm actually fighting for. Um, but, you know, I think the more opportunities that Texans have to see us side by side, the better our chances, and he knows that. And so he's fighting like hell to, to try to keep people from being able to have enough information to go to the polls and choose the person who's more, more closely aligned with their values. I want to ask you briefly in our final moments here, pretty quickly, if you can here, MJ, Supreme Court, um, if, if elected, you would have a vote on the next justice uh, to be you know, nominated and uh, confirmed at the Supreme Court. What should the next president do? Should the next president expand the Supreme Court like you know, Democrats have talked about packing the court? I think we need term limits, frankly, Jason. I think that term limits, um, the judges are getting appointed younger and younger. We're living longer and longer. Um, and in order to make sure that we have people on the bench that are not disconnected from the values of our country and not disconnected from the challenges of the regular everyday people who are boots on the ground in this country, um, that the best thing to do is to have term limits. All right. MJ Hagar, thank you so much for the time. Good luck. Thank you, Jason.